Welcome to my uh, C-Risk uh, update class. So again, this is a new version of this class for me. I've been teaching the C-Risk for uh, four years now. Um, it's not one of those classes where like the CISSP where they hold the test or now that, you know, you can take the test electronically anytime you want. With the C-Risk, they've only been running it twice a year. So I don't get the same demand. Uh, I did just recently teach this class and it went over very well and I figured I've got to preserve it, but I also wanted to integrate uh, the NISC risk management framework where I thought uh, appropriate. So uh, here you go, welcome. And I appreciate everybody coming today and helping me get a little bit better for this. And uh, again, the, the goal of this is to record it and I'm uh, experimenting with YouTube paid content. So I'm gonna uh, update, uh, upload this stuff to YouTube, assuming I, I get everything right. And, uh, oh no. Muted. Unmuted. I'm having problems with my mic for some reason. What is going on here? I keep muting myself and unmuting myself. Let me shut down one of these other computers here. I'm not stealing any bandwidth. All right. If you're not familiar with the C-Risk program, by the way, um, it's from the ISACA, the same organization that brings you to the CISA and the CISM. And if anyone's done any research on the CISM, and well, where does the C-Risk uh, fall in relationship? Well, the official uh, story is that the C-Risk is more middle management where CISM is higher, to higher uh, risk executive. Um, but I've noticed another pattern. It seems to me, and this goes back to something I was saying before we, I started the recording, that the um, CISM is more in line with the ISO. And as such, uh, an organization that's in the UK, um, they use UK style English and they follow UK style. So, so if you, you noticed, uh, if you took your test, your CISM, remember you, you worked for organizations. And uh, my favorite is you didn't have rights or, or, or privileges, you had uh, entitlements, right? Uh, so they used the proper Queen's English. This seems to be more in line with NIST. Another reason why I, I, it was my first uh, of the my three risk classes too, that I wanted to integrate the RMF because I figured it's already close to NIST anyway. They use very similar terms. And in fact, I was quite, I'm, I'm quite certain that they used uh, NIST uh, uh, 800-39 and 37 for the risk uh, uh, terminologies and stuff. All right, so uh, it, it's been getting good reviews, uh, gold winner, best certification, blah, blah, blah. And if you want to uh, go on and take the C-Risk test, I highly recommend that you, you buy their tests. So um, you buy, they have a, the official review manual and they have uh, their practice test. And it's not really much uh, to go on. It's not, uh, even with the CISM, there isn't much, but they, this is it. I only know of two things. You could get the uh, electronic version of the review question. So you get the um, updates. Uh, otherwise you get a book that's just good for a year, but um, that's about it. And you could take my stuff. <laughs> I hope this does help. So uh, our goal is, is, of course, when I teach a certification class, I want you to be able to pass that certification. So that I try to stay focused on that. This is primarily a C-Risk exam prep class. Uh, but I also want you to get better at your job. And a good deal of, of that today is, is understanding uh, the process that NIST has defined for the risk management process. Uh, I want you to get through life using the fewest amount of keystrokes, trying to save you time. And that's not just a wise guy thing whether for the tester in real life, when you are given a, a project, your goal is to complete that project in the least amount of time and the least amount of cost. And when you're taking a test, um, uh, often that you, you don't get one right answer and three wrong answers. You might get four answers that all complete the process. They all meet the scope of that question, but one of them did it faster. One of them costs less money, and that was probably the right answer, right? So that's our, in project management, you have the triple constraints. We're going to see that coming up here. But you want to meet the scope of what you of that process is supposed to do. Get done what you're supposed to do. Um, but uh, do that on a, in a, you know, you have a limited schedule and you have a limited budget. So we're going to try and get this done as, as effectively and as efficiently as possible. All right, and then help secure the future for the Commonwealth. That's our major goal. 
you know, um, you know, a lot of problems. And you're going to hear me sometimes cross boundaries. You're not supposed to talk about politics and religion, and I love to. Um, and, you know, I don't know. We have a, uh, didn't have problems in the world, but it's certainly uh, our capabilities got, have gotten higher that uh, problems get, you know, magnified. Um, and uh, we're all guilty. Uh, I know I am of, of causing problems, and, and I hope that uh, that's not all I do. Uh, I try to make solutions, and I try to work together as a team. I believe that we're all here working for, uh, you know, for DNA or whatever religion you support. Commonwealth. Our schedule. Um, today is, if you're taking the test, honestly, I think I hit about 80% of it today. We're going to understand the basic risk management process of how to, in their taxonomy, they say identify, assess, um, uh, mitigate, and then monitor your, your risks. So you you want to uh, you know understand the basic uh, process, no matter who you do. And I like the NIST uh, process systems, but you want to understand the, the basic of how do I plan, do, check, and act. You know. Um, to do your job better, if this is really about understanding the risk management controls, then tomorrow I like to go into a little more detail than you probably need for the test of how these IT controls work. This is information technology controls. That's what they want to know. And um, the controls could be anything from training to uh, that we do um, a waterfall model, or we do uh, some form of uh, agile, uh, uh, you know, uh, development. The controls could be that we have audits, but the controls are often in IT. Things like encryption, firewalls, intrusion detection systems. So we're going to go over some of those controls in a little more depth, and particularly as a network guy and a, and a person who's done a lot of uh, crypto research, I like to focus on those, and I find encryption especially important. I find that most people overteach it and they lose people. So I just want you to understand right now one basic concept that most of our politicians don't seem to get. In fact, I haven't heard any politicians seem to understand what encryption really does for us besides making secrets. All right, so if um, uh, Valerie, I hope that's your old ID and you were able to log back in uh, and I just saw it. So I hope you're still there. Um, let's say that Tyson and I are the only two guys with the keys to the filing cabinet. Well, we can encrypt, meaning I can send things to Tyson that no one else can see. I can lock them up in that filing cabinet. And no one else can see them. But that's not the only service we get. If Tyson opens up the cabinet and sees something in there that he knows, well, he didn't put it in there. Well, assuming perfect key management, if Tyson and I are truly the only two people with keys, and this is a good system, you can't pick these locks, then that thing came from Larry. Does that make sense? Now, I'm going to ask people this, so it helps make sure you, you can still hear me. But I, you know, I want to see people type in the chat box. Yeah, okay. So that's how authentication works. We don't just get the ability to hide things. Many people th equate security with confidentiality. And that's not all security is. Many times, it's just knowing that it's authentic. Right? It's not important to uh, Microsoft that the service pack was kept secret. It's important to the consumer that that service pack truly came from Microsoft. One of my favorite things that encryption allows uh, for today and, and enables a, in a great way, a service that we knew we were supposed to get as children, and we forgot mostly when we built the Internet. And it's like a pet peeve of people. It's, it stores everywhere now. The smart card versus the memory card. The news people, when I hear them talk, never get it right. They never express why the smart card's better the chip card better than the magnetic stripe card. As children, we knew that before you started talking to someone on a telephone, you authenticated both ends. You said, hi, this is me. You identified yourself. And then you said, who are you? 
You want to know who they were too. Memory cards only say, hi, this is me. They don't say, and who are you? And this is why people could set up at a very simple level skimmers that could read your bank cards and then copy them. Your chip card doesn't do that. Your chip card just says, your, it says, hi, this is me. Who are you? Because I'm not going to tell you anything until you tell me who you are. Other than I'll give you who I am. I'll tell you who I am and where my bank is. Name, rank, and serial number, whatever. <laughs> but I'm not telling you any information until I know who you are. Oh, you're Target. Oh, all right, Target. Yeah, you can know my credit card number. And that's because of encryption. So these are very important controls. That control, by the way, will you validate both ends of the connection. And for me, it's one of the most overlooked controls. And, and most people don't get it. If I can't get my politicians to describe it right, I can't get people in the news to describe it right, we're going to keep doing it wrong. It's called mutual authentication. I need to know both ends of the connection. Outside of the scope of this class, but more into the terms of I want you to be able to secure yourself in the future. And I know my chair creaks here. Told that it's uh, it's okay by some students. They said no, because we know you're, uh, you know, it's a real chair or something. It's kind of comfy. One guy said, "I don't tease me." Um, IPv6. Anybody here doing IPv6? None of my army guys have already started rolling it out. It's a big issue on how to. Uh, we were supposed to use IPsec. IPsec, in my experience, didn't come out right. Um, it can do all kinds of things. It can secure your IP connections. And yet, all people seem that I know do with it is set up a, uh, a virtual private network. But that's not all IPsec does. One of the major things is I'll know who I'm talking to. Um, all right, well, those are the controls. Now, when I teach uh, like CISSP or, or any type of security class, again, going back to the concept that most people equate confidentiality with security. But we know it's the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And for you NISC RMF people, you get that, especially uh, in uh, 860. Let's look at confidentiality, and I put my money in the bank. It's very important to me that people don't know how much money I, I have in the bank. It's, you know, it's not their business, really. So confidentiality is, is important. It's also important to me that the numbers are accurate, integrity. If I put in 1,000, I don't want to look in there and say, what do I say 999 or something? Integrity is very important. But the most important thing to me is when I try to take the money out, I can get it. Hey, my money's not coming out. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Greenblatt. That's been secured. For me? That's not security. That's a, com that's a denial of service. We have problems in life. Things will happen. Business continuity management is making sure that you continue your process even though they had a problem. You know, I, I used to uh, use a term a lot with uh, young kids when I, when I work with them. I, I'd say, uh, you know, don't give me an excuse for failure. Everyone says, don't give me excuses. That's not true. And people do like to have excuses when it's for success. You know, if you say, oh, I couldn't get it done because my mom made me go to the store. But nobody wants to hear that. But if you say, I wouldn't have been able to get it done except for my mom helped me with, then I don't mind that, right? So give me an excuse for success. Business continuity management is the toughest thing. Probably the toughest part of security. Many people say it's the most overlooked part. So we're going to look at ways to keep it running. My mother was often like uh, the father for my big fat Greek wedding. But she herself was Irish and, and other mix of things. She liked to just say Irish. I think she might have been more English than that. But anyway, um, she she was very well read and, and uh, speaks seven European languages. And she knew ancient Greek and modern Greek. And uh, she'd always tell me, it comes from the Greek, Larry. It comes from the Greek. Well, uh, what we a lot of the words we use come from the Greek. Uh, cyber, many people think, means something to do with computers. No, no, no. Cyber and uh, the word govern both come from the uh, Greek, the kybernon. Kybernon was the helmsman of a ship. 
So it, it literally means to steer, to steer. That's why governance is about picking direction. Management gets you there in the least amount of time and the least amount of cost. But let's say, you know, we get a new president and they pick the wrong direction. It doesn't matter if we managed it well. There, we went to the wrong direction as fast as possible. <laughs> We've got to get to the right direction. Um, and when you're steering a ship, if you're paying attention, if you're not texting, but you're actually on the lookout, you can steer out of the way of dangers. Well, dangers that you see. There would be dangers that you can't see. One of the worst dangers are cliffs under the water. You see the island and you say, oh, it's good two miles out. But no, it's right in front of you. A good deal of it just happens to be a little bit underwater. Enough where you can't see it, but your boat will still hit it and be ruined. That's very bad. Uh, risk, risa, the cliffs under the water, really means today unforeseen danger. Now, security is about prevention, detection, and response. How can you prevent dangers that you couldn't see? You couldn't prevent it things that you, you detected when you hit it, or you learn from history. Maybe you hit it once, but you wrote it down and documented your mistake and knew, don't do that again. Or maybe you learn from somebody else. They hit it. And you learned whether to read, uh, you know, their comments or, you know, we put up lighthouses and stuff uh, to help, to help uh, so we don't make that mistake again. But a good deal of security is detection and response. And that's what makes business continuity management so hard. When we talk about ways to handle a risk, we typically think of, um, I could uh, avoid it. Just don't do it. I, I could reduce it. Uh, I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to do it much, and I'm going to wear my seatbelt when I do. Uh, or I could um, transfer it. You do it. <laughs> or I could live with it. I accept it. Well, acceptance means I accept I can't prevent. It doesn't mean you're not going to detect and respond. And that's what separates acceptance of a risk from negligence. We're always going to talk about due care and due diligence. Due diligence means to think before you act. And due care is to take action. And whenever possible, we take action to prevent the problem in the first place. But if you can't prevent it, your due care means that you have ways to detect and respond. Otherwise, you're negligent. The C-Risk exam uh, is broken into four domains. Uh, risk identification. And here's where taxonomies change. All right, so in their taxonomy, they have a two-step process of what are the risks, identify, and then assess what's my impact and likelihood. A lot of people say risk assessment's the first part, and then you have risk analysis. And some people just put it all together and call it risk assessment, like much of NIST. Just watch out for terminologies. There's something that uh, is known as semantics of business vocabulary and business rules, SBVR. Uh, in fact, let me bring it up. It's one of my favorite concepts in, in uh, oh gosh, in the world maybe, because I think that most problems are not because Bob was good and Alice was bad or vice versa, but because we misunderstood each other. SBVR. Business rules, business vocabulary, whatever. Semantics of business vocabulary and business rules. People use different terms differently. Not everybody uh, you know, works together and, 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 and learn the exact same phrases to do stuff. When you're taking a test, you really want to know their semantics. Um, if you're talking to a, a network guy and you talk about MAC, a Mac, he probably thinks you mean, oh, the media access control. But if you talk to a, um, uh, a crypto person, you talk about Macs, they're going to they're think you mean a message authentication code. So when you 
when you talk to other people from different wherever, different parts of the world, different uh, parts of your family, you know, people use different words differently, and and you want to understand their syntax and their their um, uh, context. So, all right. So in the context of the of the ISACA, risk identification is identifying, hey, this could go wrong. And generally, that's looking at threats, or excuse me, I should say assets. What do we have? The threats, what could go wrong with it? And then the vulnerability. So I could say the asset is a guitar I own. And uh, the threat is it could burn. Uh, or the threat is fire, rather. And the vulnerability is that this guitar is made of wood and it's flammable. Right. All right, then the assessment here would be, What's the impact if my guitar were to burn? How much would I lose? What's the likelihood I'm going to get my, my guitar is going to burn? And uh, then in risk response and mitigation, how could I prevent, detect, or respond to my guitar burning? And then I, 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 I put in so, I, these controls. Prevention, detection, I can't prevent all my problems. So risk control, uh, uh, control monitoring, I have to keep looking. Well, I have to look at did the risks change. Are there more fires out there? Do I own more guitars? And control monitoring, how are the sprinklers doing? How is our fire extinguishers doing? How's my fire insurance? Did that go up? Do I need to change that? The only thing you can count on in life, they say, is change. So that's why we have to continuously monitor. We continuously monitor the environment. We continuously monitor our assets. We continuously monitor our controls. Now, in the context of uh, those who fall under 8510 or following the, the uh, NIST RMF, um, they have the first step is categorized. Now, here's this SBVR issue. For some places, you mean classify? Well, it's not just classifying. We're also compartmentalizing. Classifications could be like high, medium, and low. But compartments could be like um, for HR, for sales, or uh, confidentiality, integrity, availability. So that's their categories. Now, the NIST RMF is based on the categories of uh, FIPS, which is a, a requirement. You must follow FIPS. Federal Information Processing Standards, and 860, uh, the uh, special publications are guidelines. So uh, if it's not explicitly spelled out in FIPS, then you would follow the guideline. Uh, this is where it changes in 8510. So they have uh, uh, CNSSI uh, 1253 that will have other things that trump this. Step two, select controls, and again, those will be specified. So step one and step two are redefined in the CNSSI uh, 1253. So anybody following the RMF will need to be familiar with those. Then you implement those controls. You implement them in a lab first. When we do our assessment on step four, we're going to assess before we even put it into production, but then continuously reassess. We're, like any risk activity, uh, we try to do these things at least once a year or after a significant change. Now, before it goes into production, when we're testing it in the lab, we're going to have step five authorized. Now that the, here's the results of the assessment report, we have certification where you know a technical person would say, "Okay, I'm certain that it was able to whatever." Um, perform in, in this amount of time. It was able to complete the process in whatever uh, one-tenth of a second. Uh, I'm also uh, quite uh, certain that it costs this much money. I'm also quite certain that um, it takes up this much space and it draws this much power. That's what certification means, to be certain. A cred, cred comes from the Greek. It means to believe. Actually, it comes from the Latin, but Via the Greek, I'm sure. Uh, cred means to believe. So if something's incredible, you don't believe it, right? But when they accredit something, when a, when a designated authorizing official or accrediting official says, okay, you are authorized to do this. When something's accredited, it means I believe that this thing that you're certain about is adequate for now. I'm going to relook at it and make sure that that's true later on. That could change, right? And that's why we monitor. 
we monitor again the the uh, environment. We monitor our assets. We monitor the threats. The uh, excuse me, our controls. Eighty-five ten oh one, the risk management framework for DoD. Um, I believe it came out in 2014 as a requirement for everybody to, to uh, do their best to be compliant by the end of this year, I believe. All the, uh, the, the DOD, not easy, uh, but uh, there's actually every NIST document kind of is important. Now, 8510 is the, the uh, instruction for this. Um, <clears throat> 80, excuse me, uh, 5144 is uh, just assigning who's in charge, the, the, the CIO. For, for the uh, for the DOD, thirty seven is the risk management framework, a, a basic guideline. Uh, FISMA, uh, we we'll don't really talk too much about uh, the Federal Information Security Management Act, but it's a requirement. Really, the bigger documents for those in eighty five ten are going to be CNSSI twelve fifty three, eight hundred fifty three, and eight hundred fifty three A, which is used. Eight hundred fifty three is the um, the guideline for all the uh, controls, types of controls you can have. And then 853A is the assessment document that corresponds to that. So we'll look at that a little bit on day three. Some of the different uh, um, differences between 1253 and uh, the, just the NIST RMF. For one thing, the high water mark is, is more associated with confidentiality. If I merge, say, uh, uh, a confidential document with a secret document, it has to take on the higher thing. But if I mix a medium integrity with a low integrity document, it becomes low. Um, associations for uh, confidentiality and integrity are, are explicit. And you're, there are um, uh, tables that you, you'll see in Appendix D, and then overlays in Appendix F, which is actually uh, additional downloads. So it's not really contained in the document. But we'll look at some of these and how, when we're doing the, those first two steps of categorizing the information and categorizing the, uh, the, the, the assets, um, this will happen here. All right, we live in the information communication age. I don't know when that started. I've read people say that that really started around uh, World War II. Um, Alvin Toffler, who wrote Future Shock, and The Third Wave, and uh, War and Anti-War, uh, talks about these things. But uh, Sun Tzu in The Art of War discussed information as the most important thing in warfare um, 2,500 years ago. The most famous line would be something like, you have to know yourself, you have to know the enemy. So just so awareness is the number one countermeasure. You've got to know the terrain. If I didn't know it was going to rain tomorrow, I wouldn't have brought an umbrella. And one thing I'm aware of is that I don't know it all. I've been involved in uh, IT risk management and, and uh, teaching uh, uh, risk management certifications for 16 years. I've been involved in IT since uh, 85, 84, 85. Um, been a network geek since uh, the Networks came out. I was doing IP stuff in the 80s. Um, but I don't know at all. No, I learn from you guys. I learn from my students all the time. And my wife, she's uh, she likes to tell people, uh, she's from Taiwan, so if I do her accent, she says, uh, Larry, good to talk, talk, talk. But if you need somebody to do the work, hire me. So I learn a lot from her. She uh, was a NIST, uh, excuse me, a ISO, a 27001 certified risk uh, auditor for many years. We met at IBM in the early 90s, uh, but she um, she's now in incident management for a large farm. So she, she just constantly learning new stuff under the pressure. I get to go away and I don't have emergencies like, Larry, I have to learn this now. And people call me up, but she gets, you know, held up at work for hours or get called and be on their computer at home for many hours. Uh, you don't need to know much about me. And since I'm recording this, you'll be able to uh, to read that later. But I, 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 majorly what I want to do, I, I hope to be a musician. I hope to call myself a musician, amateur musician. So far, nothing's taken off. Uh, I've been in a band on and off for many years. Uh, Gung Ho is a guy I grew up with as teenagers. We still get together every couple of years. Swing and John is my brother and I. I've uh, been involved in martial arts. You'll see a bunch of martial arts analogies this week. Uh, but I have <laughs> obviously I've been involved in IT since '84. Now, um, 
one of my uh, coaches in martial arts, I'll go back a page, great Joe Lewis. I'm a third degree black belt in the Joe Lewis fighting system. Joe Lewis uh, invented, or was the first American uh, kickboxer. He started American heavyweight full contact uh, kickboxing and uh, held the title for many years. Um, he passed in 2011, and when he um, he was never big uh, on followers anyway. I remember many many years ago, I'm saying, guys, don't follow me. I hate followers. Uh, you know, I make a lot of mistakes in life, and when I do, I need help. You know who can't help me? Followers. They'd make the same darn mistake I'd make. A good leader doesn't have followers. A good leader has fellowships with other leaders and other styles. Somebody's stronger in a subject than I am. That's pretty cool. Well, before he died, his last lesson, he was taking off his gloves. He knew he was going to die. He had cancer. And uh, he said, well, I'm going, guys. Don't be teaching Joe Lewis style. That'd be stupid. The only things you can honestly teach a man are things you could make work. Now, there are probably some things you could make work that I never made work. You don't want to deny your students of that. And there might be some things I can make work that, that you could. But I hope, my sincere hope is that some of the things I taught work for you. That's all. Don't go teaching Joe Lewis style. So I made up cyber kung fu. Uh, and that's just a, a you know, funny term. I don't really, I have no black belts or anything like that. Uh, but uh, as cyber, we know what that means. It means to steer. And I want you to take responsibility for your life. You know? um, kung fu is another misunderstood term. People think it means something like martial arts, but it doesn't. It, it, uh, it means to spend time and energy. So if you're familiar with uh, the books by Malcolm Gladwell, Blink, the tipping point, uh, outliers. Uh, he talks about the, the 10,000 hours. To become a master in a subject requires that you spend time and energy on it. That's that's what makes somebody so good. You know, it's not like the guy, you watch these movies, you're the chosen one. Mm, yeah, sort of. The only thing that was chosen was that you happened to be interested and decided to spend that many hours in that subject. You know, Why do the guys spend so much time juggling balls? So, yeah, after 10,000 hours, you became a master juggler. But why did he pick juggling? All right, the triple constraints I mentioned. We want to understand the scope. And with semantics of business vocabulary changing so much, that's the hardest part. The hardest part in developing a solution for anything, for anybody, is understanding what they actually wanted. Because we tend to color it with what we think they want. You know, we misunderstood them. If I asked you to bring me a picture of a dog tied to a fence, some of you might Take a picture of a dog, tie it to a fence, and go, here, that's what you said, picture of a dog tied to a fence. No, 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 I wanted you to tie a dog to a fence and take a picture of it. But the same sentence can be interpreted many different ways. SBVR, to me, is, is really the way that our, our politicians need to, to think. And, and we'll stop calling people bad people and good people and instead have a lot less misunderstandings and figure out the proper solution for people. Not easy. Not easy at all. Oh. Sorry about that. Let's turn that down. Oh, that is my daughter. So I'll have to let her know. In case it's, uh... I'll text her in a moment here. All right, so we know that uh, the hardest part is develop, uh, understanding the scope, uh, and we're given a schedule and a budget. You can't get things done. Oh, I'm going to pause my recording here. This must be important. All right, so imagine you're the coach of a team. You're the new coach, and you kind of even if you understood the scope, you can't just like take forever. You got until the start of the season, and you can't just spend whatever you want on the players that you need. You got a limited budget. And this is when realism gets there. Setting the scope to me is governance. That takes some management as well. Um, but so it's a mixture of both. But time and schedule are all management to me. Process management. Process. I can't find the Greek origin. I find the Latin. Process comes from the, the, the route to proceed, to move forward. We measure time two ways. Some drawing tools. Where are my drawing tools? There 
There we go. It's not the greatest color. More drawing options. We'll leave that alone. I don't know how much person. Oh, there we go. We measure time in state. Let's say I was driving down the road and I got a flat. Well, when you get a flat tire, your car doesn't perform right. You're a risk to yourself and to other drivers on the road. You owe it to everybody to pull over to a safe place. Safe. Now you do a damage assessment. Determine how bad is it. Can I fill this up with a fixer flat? Do I got to swap tires? What am I doing here? Am I calling for somebody? All right. So say I put on a donut tire. I'm recovered, but um, I don't have another spare. The emergency's not over, not until I get my original tire replaced or repaired, and then I can return to normal, and that's to reconstitute. Now, these are states in time. The state is a point. Right, the flat's the state. I have the safe state. I have the recovered state. I have the reconstituted state. But how do I do that? What are the steps to pull over to the side of the road in, in such a way that you know it's safe? How do I proceed? And that's what a process is. How do I move from state to state? The only thing you can count on in life is change. Controlling change is process, process management. Does that make sense, everybody? Yeah. Einstein said that time was the fourth dimension. We have the, the dimension of height and width and depth. But time is the fourth dimension. And every time they try to explain it to me, they overdo it. It's like teaching encryption. They overteach it. I don't need to know all these weird physics concepts to, to appreciate what time is. They try to tell me that humans don't perceive time. They got to draw these weird cones. Um, I don't perceive time? Really? You mean to tell me I don't know the difference between the way you look and the way you walk? Of course we do. Of course we do. I, I hope that the if I have one contribution to physics, it's to remove that stupid veil that says we don't understand time. Of course we do. Some people are better at it. Some people are better at, at, at long-term planning versus short-term planning. Of course. Well, let me go back here. Edward uh, Deming um, created this Plan to Check Act model. Um, to help us in process management. And he actually got this uh, concept from his teacher at the time who worked at Western Electric, Walter Schuert. Walter Schuert was an engineer at Western Electric, didn't understand why a component built in the same factory might last three months, might last three years. When they build it, they must have varied their process. The process changed somehow. Well, of course, humans are always going to change a process. As a musician, I know there's no way to play the same song the same way twice. Yeah, you listen to your favorite artist, that's not going to happen. Humans can't do the process the same. All right. Uh, I'm going to define a process to, for a, and, and the, the architecture for a, a person to drive their car into their garage every day knowing that they vary their process. All right. All right. I know that, the first of all, the doorway must be wider than the car, or else the process won't even work. But how much wider? One atom on either side of the car. I know I would scratch my car. So we, we allow room for shift and drift in a process. All right, 10 feet on either side of the car. That sounds unmanageable. It sounds unreasonable. What Walter Sheward and Edwards Deming mostly contributed was that for processes to be managed, 
we must reduce variation to a manageable level. And we do this by making a plan. This is what I'm going to do. As a musician, I might have a list of songs that I'm going to play. And then I play the songs. My brother and I, we used to get in a fight here, by the way. And then we'd argue, who screwed this one up? Excuse me. Uh, so I tended to record our, our, our uh, performances. Check. And then act would be like, all right, well, I obviously have a problem with this song. I need to fix that. Or, Greg, you need to acknowledge that you made a mistake. He couldn't do that. So that's why we're not playing together right now. I hope at some point we, we work this out. No, he's a much better musician than I am, but uh, that's all he does. And uh, it's just some type of sibling rivalry that goes on there. So you act and you improve your process. I love the development life cycle. When, whether I take a test or just complete a process or take on a process, I always have this in my uh, in my my heads up display. Actually, I like to have a few things. I have the PDCA model, you know, and sometimes this helps me when you're taking a test. We're during the planning stage. Can I make you the presenter? Uh, did you want to share something, Valerie, on on PDCA? Oh. Oh, okay. Um, when you're taking a question, it's like during the, the um, uh, requirements uh, setting for a, a new application that the uh, you know sales department wants, you're in the planning phase, and you'll go through all the steps, the quality controls that you know you need to do here. Um, during the implementation <clears throat> or during production, you're doing it, checking, you're monitoring, you're you're um, auditing, you're assessing. 853A uh, and act, you know, based on uh, that you had a fire and you learned that you've got to make another fire door or whatever, or during a fire drill that you should have another sprinkler or light the evacuation route better, whatever, you have a better plan. All right, the, the SDLC, get a, uh, you know, the highlighter is kind of annoying. It's too dark. I'll use red here. You start off in a development life cycle with some things with a feasibility. Should I do this? I got a great idea, I think. The only people I know that want to open up a business that I know when they understand what all that means, they're, they're not going to want to open up a business. Dude, you don't want to open up a business. Just because you're good at some things doesn't mean do that. Um, so we decide maybe we're not going to do that. I'm going to have a new song, and I'd like to... Uh, uh, have a choir of people singing behind me. That's not feasible. I don't have access to that. But that's not true in security. Should I get insurance on my car? Yeah, you will. Should we put sprinklers in the building? Yes. So in security, we start with project initiation. And this is when senior management, well, if nothing else, my schedule, my budget. Of course, the scope. Imagine this is a process, um, I, I like to use the analogy of a restaurant, and the owner of the restaurant can set the direction and says, I, I want a, a new kitchen. Well, to really understand how to architect what should be in that kitchen, now the owner could say, you got this much money, and it's got to be ready by this date. But I'd have to work with the users of that kitchen to really f understand the functions and how well they must do that function. You know, it's one thing to get a really sharp knife. It's another one to get a, a knife that I can continuously maintain and sharpen. You know what I mean? Those Ginsu knives are sharp when you first get them. Hard metal knives don't sharpen real well, though, once you've got them. Right? You want to maintain better assurance, you get a softer metal, uh, but you can sharpen it regularly. Yeah, we have to work with the cooks and the, and the, uh, the dishwashers to really understand. And this helps us understand the full scope. Understanding what the users need in my limited schedule and budget. Then we design a solution that meets those requirements. And this is more for a CISM. CISMs are involved in architecting these solutions. Our job as risk professionals in the C risk is just kind of working with the users and understanding their needs in many ways. Helping, assisting maybe in developing and acquiring, either we build it or we bought it. 
testing it, making sure it meets their needs. Now notice the difference terms here between verify and validate. When somebody architects a solution, they'll build a list of all the things that should be in here. So we'll call this a checklist. So if this were a kitchen, make sure they have 30 amp GFCI circuits. And when the electrician comes in, he should verify against the list. Did I do that right? Did I build it according to design? But a much more important test, the user acceptance test, is that it actually worked the way the user said, I need it to work. This is what I need to happen. Because if the architect thought they wanted them to take a picture of a dog and tie that to a fence, you could verify that you build it just exactly that, but it wouldn't validate what the user needed. So verification says, am I building it right? But validation doesn't work right. And then we operate and maintain it. Now, if this were a kitchen, that means you're going to use the kitchen and you're going to clean it. Nobody likes to clean a kitchen. I tease my children all the time. Uh, I, I say everybody wants to eat food that was prepared in a clean kitchen. Everybody wants to sleep in a clean bedroom. Everybody wants to use a clean bathroom. Nobody likes cleaning a kitchen, making up their bed or cleaning their bedroom or cleaning a bathroom. Nobody wants to do that, but we, we want to use it that way. Monitor is in real time, typically. We, we just constantly, hey, is that thing running hot? Feel that. Is that feeling right? Audit is periodically some outsider comes in and says, and they had nothing to do with installing or testing it or even uh, operating it. They just come in and say, let me take another look at that. I have a list of requirements. This thing's supposed to be full into these thresholds to make sure that you are. That's what management generally cares about. What did the auditors say? And then you're going to retire, dispose of it. You might get rid of that kitchen because you're building a new one. I retired the MS Mail server at Scott Paper in the 90s because they were going to exchange. The mail process is still there, of course, well, was. Hardest part of uh, SBVR, hardest part of um, taking a test. Did I get anybody on that? Did you read it wrong? Anybody misunderstand that? Peter got it right, huh? Was it your first time seeing that or no? There was a famous one. I remember since as a kid, years ago. Paris. Many people read that as Paris in the spring, but it doesn't say that. It says Paris in the spring. Our eyes, yep, Peter's aware of that one too. Our eyes tend to ignore things we didn't expect to see and add in things we expected to. That's why understanding requirements is so hard. Everybody else still there? Peter's helping me know that he, you know, at least my end is working. Tyson's still there. Valerine. Kishena. No, oh, great. great. Many people think of the word tax and they think it's a burden. Tax actually means to classify. If I took all my clothes out of the dryer and I just threw them on the guest bed, there's no classification scheme there. It's very simple to put things away, very fast. If I had a limited schedule, I, I, I'd very quickly do that. The hard part is when I try to retrieve it. The hardest part about security is availability. It's not confidentiality or integrity. To me, anyway. I'd say availability is the hardest. So to make it available when I need it, 
to help it, I create a classification scheme and, and I put them away in some type of order. So I put shirts in the shirt drawer and pants in the pants drawer, underwear in the underwear drawer. Not everybody agrees that that's right. Or even within that, NIST might say, and remember, T-shirts are shirts. But the ISO might say, no, T-shirts are underwear. And I go with, well, don't overtax me. What drawer has more free space at this moment? So we have classification issues and taxonomy problems. But I also find that most people misunderstand the taxonomies of information security. When you look at information, you have information that you know about and you, and you, and you write about it. So if I had a chest of drawers and one of the drawers says shirts, and I open it up and there's shirts in there, then you'd say I have information. I, I things I know that I knew. But if one of the drawers says private and it's locked, I don't know what's in there. I know there's something in there, and I know that I don't know it. The things I, I, I know that I don't know, I have some information. And then uh, there could be a secret panel in the back. I didn't even know that you could have a secret panel. I never even bothered to look there. These are the things that we didn't know that we didn't know. And many people tell me that's where our big problems come from. But I argue, no, no, you left out a fourth choice. What about the things you thought you knew turned out to be wrong? Because my missing shirt was actually in the drawer marked pants. I didn't even bother looking there. This is how most attacks work, guys. When people, whether it's malicious code or social engineering, the, a phishing attack, whatever, they don't say this is an evil virus, click on it. They say, hey, you want to play this game on Facebook with me? Now, you thought it was a game, right? Uh, it, it's how social engineering, he said he worked here. And these are the most effective attacks because they play on our psychology. We want to trust. This is a case of mistrust. When people attack information, these attacks come into two basic categories. A passive attack is when someone's listening, but they're not talking. Uh, I could have like an Ethernet cable where I, I, I cut the send pair. All I'm doing is receiving. If someone were on the opposite uh, side of a room here and they're, they're ear to uh, the wall, I couldn't tell if they were eavesdropping. Eavesdropping is a passive attack because they're not sending anything. There's nothing for me to pick up and go, aha, look. Active attacks are when they are sending something. Somebody keeps calling me up on the phone. You know, I can't stop that. I can certainly tell when it's happening sniffing and password cracking often. These are often passive attacks. An active attack, though, a denial of service and covert channels. You know, I could I could stop people from eavesdropping if I knew. I could have soundproofed my room. I could have encrypted the traffic, I hope. Passive attacks are considered undetectable. You don't know that they're having, but they are preventable. You could have taken steps. But an active attack, while detectable, is not always preventable. You can't stop all denial of service attacks. I can't stop people from calling me on the phone. A covert channel is anytime someone uses a medium in a way it wasn't supposed to be used to relay information. A very basic way to do this. You can't stop them all. Let's say that there's a, um, uh, I have a friends in China and I know that the Chinese government has a very aggressive firewall policy, the, the, the great firewall of China, but they allow an email so if I agree with my friend, hey, if you get an email from my Yahoo account, write down one. If you, uh, welcome Marcus, if, if you um, get a, an email from my Gmail account, write down zero. Now, it'll take a while to sneak out anything large, but I could sneak out a password in a day. Steganography, a classic covert channel. Now, if cyber means to steer, where are we going? And this, I think, is the cause of most of the problems today, honestly. Most of the big problems I watch on the news uh, are governance issues. They are, people are lost. Many people don't know where we're going. Um, 
one of my favorite books on cybernetics, and uh, cybernetics is the, is the, the uh, actually Norbert Wiener coined that term, uh, uh, talking about why would a human or a machine choose a direction? We'll talk about these later on. I find these cool concepts. Uh, I get in my Kirk and Spock uh, methodology, and you'll see or hear a lot of, I hope there's some people who like old Star Trek, because I love old Star Trek. To me, it's all about Kirk and Spock, my qualitative and my quantitative brain. Um, Spock never has a direction to go. Spock never says, Captain, I'm in the mood for Chinese food. Spock doesn't get in the mood. That's a governance issue that Kirk would say, Spock, I feel like a Korean barbecue. And then Spock could nail down, what is our schedule? What's our budget? And then he's very good. He's certain about his numbers. He's going to figure out an aggregate cost. You know, this they might have cheaper meat, but it's a two hour or a two, you know, two longer, two miles longer drive, and it's going to eat up more gas. You know, we might be better off to go the other. And plus, when you factor in tolls and our schedule, uh, it might not work for us, Captain. And watch out, Captain. That's they charge you extra for drinks. That's how they get you. You know, whatever. Um, so he's very good at, at, at figuring those things out. Well, my favorite cybernetic book, honestly, was uh, Dr. Seuss, Oh, the Places You'll Go. My favorite children's book, and I think many adults could learn from it as well. And congratulations, today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. Many, many years ago, I'm an older fellow. 55 this Saturday. Um, I fell in love with a book by Gerald O'Neill called The High Frontier. And it was written in the 70s, and you know, Al Gore didn't start the concern with environmental change due to man's uh, effects here. Uh, no, this goes way back. And um, Gerald O'Neill was a Princeton uh, professor, and he asked his students, what is the best way to deal with the um, effects of our high-tech lifestyle on the environment. And he thought he was going to either get two basic answers, go back to a simpler time, or develop greener technologies. And his students had a whole different thing he wasn't ready for, something right out of uh, uh, Tesla or, or uh, SpaceX or something. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Bezos, I know both Bezos and um, uh, Tesla guy, uh, very big fans of, of Jared O'Neill. Uh, he felt that most of the damage was done in manufacturing, and we'd do a lot better off if we just moved manufacturing to space. And we'd have a couple of side benefits. Um, first of all, it, most of the energy in, in manufacturing is, is spent fighting gravity. Well, in zero G, you wouldn't have that problem. So it'd be cheaper in the long run. And then the other thing is that you'd get better product because any product that takes a while to gel or a mold, you know, or something like that, um, will get corrupted in a gravity swamp like Earth because the, the heavier elements would sink to the bottom. So we would get better product, it would be cheaper to produce, and it would be safer. So uh, it's a long commute. So he architected uh, and he did stuff for NASA at the Ames Research Center. This is still at NASA Ames Research Center. These... Um, habitats for humans to live in in space. And uh, I, I'm just a big fan of these. So the, um, let's see here, let me get my pointer actually. There you go. Uh, this particular one is, is the most expensive and it's built to house 10,000 people, but all the materials had to come from Earth. That's uh, a little rough. Um, this one, uh, about 100,000 people. Uh, and this was made famous in movies like 2001 and recently, or a little recently, um, Elysium with uh, uh, Jodie Foster and uh, Matt Damon. Uh, and then this one is built to house 10 million people over here. And anybody a fan of a, a Japanese cartoon, Mobile Suit Gundam, these take place there. Uh, and I like this quote. Timothy Leary is another great influential artist, uh, writer in my life when I was younger. And um, he became a big fan of uh, Gerard O'Neill, and he felt that it was just a, a direction that's in us for the same reason that a bee would build a hive, humans will go into space. It's not a choice. It's genetic imperative. And he felt, he has this quote here, the crisis the human race now faces is best described as navigational. We were lost. We didn't realize where we we're going. But he felt that those first NASA uh, and, and Russian cosmonauts looked at from the perspective of, say, 10,000 years from now, 
will be as uh, um, important as those first fish that ever smelled air. I'm a big space fan, uh, and I really think that this is where we're going, and it's whether we like it or not. I don't feel like I have to raise awareness. we got to hurry up and do this or else man's going to die off. I know I have the right to mess up my life, uh, and I do worry a lot about me doing that because I'm pretty stupid at times. But I, I'm very hopeful for mankind. I really think mankind's doing fine in the long run. Yes, we have a lot of trouble now. And I hope I don't contribute any more to it. I try my best to do the right thing, but it's so hard sometimes. As an old Star Trek fan, uh, anytime I come across the ISO controls, I always think of the Federation. And a lot of people think the ISO is an acronym for International Standards Organization. No, it's not an acronym. It's a word. Come from the Greek. It means equal. 160 member body nations from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe. And as long as we agree that red light means stop and green light means go, we can share the road equally. And now we have this wonderful information superhighway, and let's share it equally. You know, but we have to agree. We have to agree on certain things. All right, so our goal, uh, pass the C-Risk exam if, if you're a test taker. Uh, I want you to understand enterprise risk management as a whole so you can do your job better. Vocational knowledge. I want you to understand and manage the controls. You know, the controls are sometimes the problems. I can control the insects in my house with bug spray that could also kill me or my dog or whatever. And when I, I implement a process, I want to make sure that it's, it's appropriate continuously and make it better. You know, we never get anything right, but hopefully we get better all the time. That's the goal. That's the direction. Some people wander around aimlessly thinking that there's no point to anything. And I definitely believe there's a point. If nothing else, to Spock's ears. No, no, I'm sorry. 